Hello, Jules. I'm Hello, Gaurav. Hi, good evening. How, how are you? I'm good fine, to thanks. see you. Good to see you guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here for this fantastic uh, eye-opening webinar. I have lots of people who are who have signed up and slowly they're coming in. Uh, welcome, Sara. Welcome, Jaydev, Jaydeep, Shalendra, Rajiv, Sanchari, Pradeep, uh, Richard, Dikshita. Welcome, welcome to this fantastic webinar. We, we're hoping to, to enjoy this uh, uh, information based, um, you know, to deepen our knowledge about Asian elephants with, with Joe's. And uh, today I've got um, my colleague Gaurav here as well, so, who will introduce himself after I've introduced myself. Let me quickly ask you first, um, am I fully audible? And uh, Joe, can you say hello? And uh, Gaurav, can you say hello so that people... Hi, everyone. Good evening. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. OK. So um, Salil, can you just check? Yes. OK. Gajinder Ji says yes. Abhi is saying yes. So which means very audible. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, friends, uh, uh, without uh, uh, wasting much time, I'll get started. Um, I won't talk about the intent of this webinar because when you signed up, you know what this is all about. I am Mohit Agarwal. For those who don't know me earlier and they've been here for the first time, I'm Mohit Agarwal. I'm an experiential ecotourism specialist. I am the founder of Asian Adventures, which is a 30 year old conservation travel company. And these webinars, um, my team and I curate on a regular basis. And every month we do one webinar with Wildlife Trust of India to support the cause uh, which they want to highlight. And today we've got the um, uh, the CEO of Wildlife Trust of India, Mr. Joe Lewis, who will talk about um, uh, you know illegal ivory trade. Let me quickly um, introduce him. Uh, Joe Lewis is a wildlife conservationist with more than 15 years of experience. He specializes in wildlife crime prevention, capacity building of enforcement officials, and project management. He possesses significant experience in developing and implementing conservation technology. Additionally, he's an expert on snake and snake bike mitigation across India. He's the founder of indiansnakes.org and Indian Bees. Dot org. Over to you, Gaurav. Go ahead and right. um, introduce yourself, and then I'll get uh, um, Louis to get started. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, good evening, everyone. Namaste. Uh, my name is Gaurav Nalkur. I'm uh, training to be an ecotourism expert. Uh, by qualification, I am a wildlife biologist. I've specialized especially in uh, urban bird diversity. And uh, I am a big believer in the fact that wildlife tourism, uh, responsible wildlife tourism can be a great tool towards raising awareness and aiding conservation. Uh, I've worked on things like uh, uh, urban bird diversity, then bird diversity in the Himalayas, and also giant squirrels. And for the last few, uh, few years, uh, I'm very happy to be working with Mohit and Nation Adventures and uh, training uh, myself in the field of ecotourism with this guidance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Just a few set of um, um, rules and pieces of information. Whatever that you think is important for you to ask, uh, type it in the chat box or put it in Q&A section. And then at the end of the, the presentation, Joe's will take your questions and we'll answer them one by one. Second thing is, just in case if there's an internet glitch, don't go away. This system has some, some sort of a panic button, which I'll press, and it reboots itself. And then we get restarted again. So just in case if that happens, don't leave the webinar and go away. Just wait for a couple of minutes, and then we'll be back. Right. Great. Over to you, um, uh, Joseph. All right. Uh, thank you, Mohit and team. Let me put my presentation on and see whether it is visible. Um, 
Mohit, uh, is the presentation visible? Yes, it is. All right. Good evening, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are joining from. Thank you very much. And uh, well, uh, when Mohit asked me about this presentation and this session on illegal wildlife trade, I thought uh, let us uh, keep it to one species, and that is uh, elephants, and talk a bit about uh, uh, the poaching of elephants and the ivory trade and how it is affecting the, the future of Asian elephants in India and also how it is, um, you know, how the trade is happening without us knowing much about it. And as Mohit said, I would love to answer questions. So if you have questions, please put it in the chat box. And uh, in case if there, uh, if there is any glitch from my side, Mohit, please, uh, you know, either give me a call or something so that I know that the presentation is not going well. All right. I will do so. Yeah. OK. Um, and also to everyone, um, you know, this is a new platform for me. So there was a bit of um, animations in the presentation which may not work. So I may do back and forth with uh, my slides a bit. All right. So what you see on the screen is my last uh, elephant sightings in um, in Assam, in Kaziranga, and that was a big, huge tusker where we were about to end our trip and we were returning. And then we saw this majestic tusker um, just walking around and not bothered about us. So I thought, let me share that happy picture to begin with. And uh, um, well, when we talk about elephants uh, in India, it's a um, lot of cultural significance we you know uh, when you ask people about elephants in india uh, they talk about you know the, the 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 decorated elephants in the temples of kerala or you know those so called beautiful looking elephants uh, which are used in uh, tourism in jaipur or in agra earlier and the wild tuskers the the famous wild tuskers of kabni or the majestic tuskers of corbett and also a lot of, um, you know, a lot of myth, a lot of culture, everything is also associated with elephants when you talk about elephants in India. But not everything is as good as it is. We also have uh, problems with uh, elephants. We also have uh, issues surrounding elephants. The top uh, left photograph, which captured the, the minds of people across the globe, actually, you know, how um, an elephant calf is, you know, chased away from the village by uh, cracking um, a firecracker at it and how, how tormenting it is for the elephant. And then there are incidents of uh, elephant capture, elephant attacking people, elephants going rogue, a lot of issues. So elephant is or elephant related issues as, are, are as big as elephants in this country. So various parts of the country, various people, various way of looking at elephant, it is it is different. Many people would love to watch an elephant in the wild. Many people may not want to have an elephant in their backyard. So today we, we, we have a, a lot of uh, positive and negative news surrounding elephants. I'm actually, I'm, I'm connected, connecting from Kerala, where uh, tomorrow morning onwards, the state forest department is counting elephants. Not only Kerala, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu together counting elephants in the wild. So there were trainings going on last two days and tomorrow morning onwards, the forest staff will count elephants. One of the leading newspapers put up the story today evening, will counting solve the problem? Because they want to know that well, where the human elephant interaction will be controlled by this counting and other exercises. So there is a, a, a lot happening with elephants. Uh, well, I am absolutely sure many of you sitting here are familiar with elephants, but uh, let me introduce elephants as, I mean, a few points about elephants. They're big. Elephants are big and they travel long distance. The photograph which you see is uh, from southern part of India. The elephants on a, on a hilltop, you know, in a grassland. So they travel from one area to another area in search of food and water. So the, that, that actually makes them the bulldozers of the forest. They, they live up to their religious name, the Vigneshura, the, the remover of obstacles. You know, if you have elephants in a forest, you can see the signs of elephants around. You will see broken branches. You will see, you know, debarked trees. You will see uprooted things. So you, you know that their elephants are there. So they 
they make ways for uh, you know other wildlife and uh, uh, the trackers in Kerala used to tell me or in, in many parts of South India used to tell me that, you know, uh, they actually follow the elephant paths because they say that elephants will find the best gradient to walk around. So they they have many roles and they, they play the role of the bulldozer also in the, elephant, uh, in the forest. And you find, uh, you know, occasionally um, lawn tuskers, but otherwise they move in herds. Uh, sometimes it is large, large in hundred, hundreds of elephants moving from one place to another place. Sometimes it is few. I mean, it's, it's less than a dozen elephants moving. So they, they move in, in a herd. And uh, as I told earlier, negative interaction is common in many landscapes, which will be, you know, either uh, for food or it is uh, a passage or it is many other reasons. So there are negative interactions. There are places in India where elephants are coming back after a few decades. So there is some interaction, which, which often it is negative interaction with people. So when you look at elephants, it is a very difficult equation we are looking at. In, in one part of our culture and religion, in our, our minds, we, we worship elephants as the elephant god. In Indian culture, um, Lord Ganpati has got a, a, a lot of significance. On the other hand, when it is a, a crop raider, when it is a, not welcomed so much in, in the surroundings, in the backyards or in your farmlands, uh, it's a crop raider or it is a, it's a damage creator. So it's, it's a paradoxical equation with an uh, elephant across the country and uh, um, well that's where I start you know we lose a lot of elephants across the country due to various reasons I would like to highlight a few things poisoning is one of the reason people put poisons in elephant uh, you know preferred food and elephants consume it we lose elephants this is a photograph from central India where the forest department is trying to revive an elephant which was poisoned. We lose a number of elephants on railway tracks across the country, whether it is Orissa, whether it is Tamil Nadu, whether it is Kerala, West Bengal. We have elephants dying on railway tracks across the country. It's, it's, it's one of the major problem um, because railways go through forested areas which are used by elephants. A number of mitigation measures were, you know, um, discovered or invented and applied in railway tracks, but still we don't have a, a complete solution to this problem. The recent uh, one is in Tamil Nadu, they have in, installed uh, artificial ca artificial intelligence cameras, AI cameras, which will uh, alert the loco pilots about the presence of elephants in the, in the vicinity of the railway tracks and help them to slow down. But still, accidents do happen and we lose elephants on railway tracks. Um, we, we also came across with, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry and pardon me for sharing this photograph. It is one of the, the, the most unpleasant photographs I have seen, you know, things like snares, snares are usually kept for small mammals or so for herbivores, but, uh, this is the, the situation of an elephant, which got into a snare in Orissa. You can imagine the kind of uh, pain and the kind of, uh, agony that an animal went through. The hind leg was caught in the snare and uh, luckily uh, someone noticed it and they managed to remove the snare. So there are there is, uh, you know, challenges of snaring happening with elephants. Electrocution is very common across the country. Uh, the, the left side photograph is from Assam where there is a postmortem going on of an elephant which entered into a paddy field. And elephants, you know, they, they find ways to destroy things around and... Uh, this guy must have uh, pushed the pole and it fallen down on itself and it died. The right side photograph is from Kerala, from Wynard, where an elephant entered into a field and you can see that uh, there was an electric line. It caught hold of it and it died um, um, an untimely death. So elephants died due to electrocution across the country. Um, well, uh, elephants also get poached. I'm, I'm sorry, there was a small animation where you could see the photograph behind it. That was a photograph of a dead elephant. And uh, it's very clear from the, the photograph of the skull, you can see that the tusk is cut off. So that shows that uh, the elephant was killed for the tusks. So today we will talk uh, a lot about uh, the poaching of elephants for ivory across the country. 
and uh, we will talk a bit about the elephant poaching and how it is happening and um, what is the reasons behind what are the drivers and what are the people behind it and why it is happening across the country um so uh you know we when we talked about um, elephant poaching and ivory um it was always we blame the chinese and japanese for the demand for ivory that's correct um both chinese and japanese people used ivory for carvings and ivory had a a lot of cultural significance in their cultures and um, you know um we always thought or we always understood or we always believed that uh, these are the people who are responsible for um, you know uh, poaching of elephants in uh, asia and africa on the screen what you can see is on the left hand side is a um, is a japanese um, henko which is uh, kept along with a piece of ivory henko is nothing but a, a personalized the signature of uh, a japanese man and or japanese person and um, a henko is a personalized um, signature device or a tool where every individual will have his own henkos and uh, the rich will buy ivory and make their uh, their henkos with ivory so that was one use for ivory and we we consider that was as a as a big market for ivory uh, trade in 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 the in in japanese uh, in japan because everyone will have their own henkos and rich people used to buy it and uh, uh, once a person die the henko is also destroyed with him so the next person will buy the next one uh in the middle you will see a typical chinese um, uh, artwork uh, chinese people were very fond of ivory and they are still fond of ivory um, um i mean when you look at these things are as art forms uh, brilliant artwork i mean they carved uh, carved various things uh, starting from dragons to common people uh, on ivory and very intricate intricate uh, carvings and so that's uh, the chinese demand for ivory they they carved uh, uh, various things on ivory and uh, this was sold in the chinese market for a premium price but uh, not only chinese but across the world people purchased this as um, you know um, collect collectors art items because ivory was always considered as a, 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 a rich man's thing so you know having an ivory statue or an ivory um, artwork is uh, is a indicator that you are rich and finally on the right side it is a it's a henko it's a miniature um, uh, thing by uh, japanese people uh, henko's uh, sorry um, it is um, um, it is a netsuke which is used by the japanese women to tie their kimonos so that also was part of their culture and they they made um, very nice figures in, on this ivory uh, carvings and uh, that was part of the japanese culture so we we thought you know most of the ivory is uh, consumed by the japanese and the um, the chinese and some by the vietnamese people uh, so that was the understanding of it so i would like to bring some idea about what is happening in the recent past about ivory and what is the role of um, the indian buyers in the ivory market um well now this is a piece of uh, unfinished ivory article which we discovered during an operation in um, southern india you can see that it is neither japanese nor chinese nor vietnamese it is very much indian it is uh, it is a it's a unfinished art where uh, ravana is being um, you know carved on a piece of ivory and you know that it is it is definitely not chinese but it is very much indian and it is work in progress so that is that is what the the story or that is what the reality i would like to discuss today with you the indian ivory market and the connection of uh, the the fascination of indians with uh, ivory and the kind of ivory trade happening within india it was very much um um i mean not very much known we've always we had ivory carvings but we thought that the ivory carvings and the and the, and the demand for ivory within the indian market is uh, very less but um, uh, some of the investigations proved that it is not yet gone it is it is still happening um these are um, photographs of uh, ivory carvings which we uh, found in 2015 and from a house in delhi and uh, that big piece of uh, ivory that tusk it is actually an entire uh, part of an entire tusk it is uh, entire ramayana which is uh, sculptured on ivory 
so you can understand uh, how the indian um, cultural connection with ivory on the left hand side you can see uh, um, uh, a bangle which is made of ivory it is fresh it is new but uh, the carvers or the the makers made it look like an antique piece of ivory and you can see the ivory uh, the typical patterns of ivory on that it is uh, decorated with some brass so that's a collector's item as a as an ornamental thing and on the right hand side it is the traditional chuda which is used in rajasthan and in in uh, in gujarat as a, um, a wedding gift uh, for females so that is also carved using ivory so this were the things which were this were the ivory products which were, which got some indian connection so would like to tell you a bit uh, about the background stories how this um, you know large pieces of tusk uh, end up in in me mega cities like delhi or uh, or kolkata or in mumbai for carving so there must be a a, a trail of um, ivory behind it or a trail of blood behind it uh, uh, which is not very uh, very pleasant so let me introduce oh before i move into that uh, in india elephants are also killed for their skin this is a uh, a thing in the northeast where elephant skin is used for making this um, beads which is uh, again um, you know a fashion item which is uh, not only uh, consumed or not only used by people in the in the eastern countries but also in european countries this is the ivory beads which were available for sale from last few years so this is manufactured from dried uh, elephant uh, skin so you can see the photograph of the elephant and the the, uh, the elephant skin which was uh, separated that was uh, a news for many of us uh, who work in conservation that elephant skin is used for making a product like this um so i was reading about uh, you know the history of ivory trade and uh, uh, very interestingly i stumbled upon uh, uh, some references in the bible you know in 950 bc king solomon um, got ivory from um from ophir which uh, the historians are saying it is uh, the coastal areas of kerala or sri lanka so that is 950 bc that is written in bible that uh, the, he he got ivory not only ivory but also peacocks and primates um so that is one reference about the ivory trade and coming a little forward into the 19, 1850s uh, the maharaja of travancore kerala gifted an ivory throne and a footstool to uh queen victoria this was um, considered as a diplomatic gift those days because um, the kerala king wanted some <coughs> protection from the east india company uh, definitely not to you know not to overpower and take away his kingdom so this was considered as a as a gift from the kerala king to the the queen and uh, probably that is uh, where the 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 phrase the ivory throne also came and this was considered as one of the best gift the the queen received and it was uh, there for display for a long time and i think now it is not out any any uh, for display because of uh, the royal family's connection with the conservation but that's also you know it's not erasing the the history that uh, ivory was um, you know considered as a as a, a good gift and um, coming forward in 2015 uh, uh, you know we stumbled upon uh lo uh, very very large cache of ivory articles in delhi uh, which was worth crores and you can see that you can see the the right hand side picture it is uh, uh you know from the inscriptions above it is an artwork 531 a uh, 27 inches that is a modern ivory artwork uh, which was available for sale in delhi um, for few lakhs um, and uh, it is it is the history of ivory trade i mean if you look at it you are looking at about you know 3000 years of history of ivory trade and uh, all of this had a connection with uh, uh, you know the southern coast and uh, especially kerala so i would like to highlight and talk a bit about this trade um would like to tell you a bit about um, operation shikar where we understood about um, ivory uh, poaching elephant poaching and uh, ivory trade in in kerala and i thought uh, i would like to i i should share some of the learnings from this uh, to make you understand that uh, how this beautiful carvings are coming from and where it is coming from and what is the the story behind it 
this was an operation which was um, conducted by the kerala forest department which was code named as operation shikar and uh, which uh, which resulted in uh, in the dismantling of uh, uh, established elephant poaching trade uh, elephant poaching and uh, trade and ivory carving network across the country um, and considered as one of the biggest um, um, wildlife crime investigation in the history of the country um well uh, i know many of you don't uh, read malayalam so i translated it uh, you know this is how the media highlighted it in 2015 june 29 uh the leading malayala the malayalam daily malayalam manorama came up with a, a front page news saying that uh, there is elephant poaching across the state and um, um the forest department is arresting the witness and poachers are roaming across the kerala forest so malayalam manorama is the widest circulated and uh, and uh, one of the i mean not one of the the top read uh, daily in the state and the newspaper had it on the front page of the the newspaper on june 29 and it actually shook the forest department and the people and the investigation agencies and the political machinery we were looking at um, elephant poaching organized elephant poaching across the state and uh, as a result of this we we came to know as part of the investigation we came to know about a lot more about this uh, ivory trade and i thought uh, today i will i'll share a bit of this insights and uh, how these things happen in the forest and uh, uh, i i would like to warn you many of these things are not going to be very pleasant uh, and uh, it is not going to be those um, happy go lucky good part of conservation this is this is what i call as the the dirtier darker uh, sides of wildlife conservation so be warned about it let's go back i mean um, you know when you talk about elephant poachers um, i think most of us don't forget veerappan kus munusami veerappan who died in 2004 if i'm not mistaken and um, on the right hand side this is again another poacher who died in 2015 um and when you look at uh, similarities i mean if you want to understand who are the poachers I and mean, when you look at elephant poaching we would like to know who are the poachers uh, when we when we look at this people i mean you know many of them i mean this poachers were worshiped as the local heroes by the local people they got into crime in the earlier ages both of them are i mean virappan and uh, vasu both are not there with us both of both were very good elephant poachers and uh, when 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 i looked at both this people they always had this larger than life attitude i mean killing an elephant was uh, a big thing for them killing an elephant was like a macho thing for uh the poachers you know um, i i heard stories about um, um wasu who used to shoot an elephant and uh, you know soon after the elephant has fallen down he will go and sit on the top of the elephant and uh, pull out a, a cigarette or a bd or a or a drink and uh, sit and drink on the dead elephant while the other people are cutting the tusk so we are looking at people who got a, a different level of um, you know um psychological thrill when it comes to poaching elephants uh these are these people i mean many people think that you know people are poor people are you know they don't have an option to do things uh, do other things but these people actually enjoyed killing elephants and um, you know this lead poachers were very good leaders i'm not getting into everything about them but a uh, few things about understanding this uh, this this people who you know done elephant poaching they were good leaders they all they managed to build, build their gang they managed to maintain their gang they managed to ensure that they do a business successfully you know uh, killing elephants and uh, collecting ivory and selling it to the right customers and making money and managing their gang and uh, but uh, uh, overall they never made it big in their life i mean they were always on the run you make a lot of money you you know often you pay bribes you you feed the local pub community you ensure that you know you get protection so they were always on the run um you know i i wonder why these people got into this uh, you know illegal trade and uh, they they had their fun they had their money but uh, they were always on the run they they were into a high risk uh, um, moderate gain because at the end of the day you know um, both of them lived not so very rich life but uh, but that is the story about the poachers these were the people who went inside the forest and killed elephants uh, but on the other hand um, you know 
I want to bring your attention to the people who actually made a lot of money. Um, this is a trader. I don't want to reveal his identity. Um, he is still alive and uh, there are cases going against him. Unlike Vasu or the poachers, um, uh, this guy live in a very, very, uh, you know, posh locality in the middle of Delhi uh, in a five story building. And um, he owns um, art galleries with, uh, you know, ultra rich clientele. You know, you, you, do, you don't go there, you know, you don't drop in as a customer. You have to you have to be invited to buy things from his art gallery. And he holidays across the world and he owns SUVs uh, and a uh, lot of servants at home and uh, very well respected in the society. And until and until the whole uh, ivory trade thing um, uh, connected him to the trade and he was arrested, people had no idea. So I want to bring your attention to, you know, your your perception about people who actually make money out of this business. These are the people who actually make a lot of money out of this illegal business. People who 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 poach elephants and uh, collect ivory live in a different world. People who don't poach and uh, make money out of ivory live in a different world. I, I remember when this man was detained and an officer asked him, about his involvement in elephant trade and ivory trade. Um, his immediate reaction was that, um, sir, how can I do that? Uh, I, I am a, I'm a big devotee of Lord Ganesha and how can I kill elephants? And that was his in initial reaction. But then later the story changed when the evidences were given to him. Um, well, I, I would like to, you know, um, show you a few things. I know this is not a very structured to talk about elephant poaching and uh, i'm trying to um you know uh, wrap a lot of things uh, in in a short period of time now i would like to show you the kind of weapons which are used in this one uh, technically these guns are known as flintlock guns and you can look at the size of the gun with a poacher this is uh, this this again um somebody who is no more who who got killed by another poacher uh, on a later day you can look at the 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 size of the gun and uh, these are guns which are locally manufactured wherever you are i mean you know in southern india you will have gunsmiths who manufacture this kind of guns uh, which are used to kill elephants and this is their primary weapon so you you have the poachers and these are their weapons and uh, uh, when you look at what they use these are modified guns and they use the window bars um, or aluminium bars to make uh, projectiles to shoot elephants because elephant is a large animal. So they have to get projectiles which can bring an elephant down. So the, the gunpowder is uh, prepared locally and um, usually the iron rod, window bar rod or uh, aluminum round bars are used as projectiles in these guns. And um, you have expertise of uh, local gunsmiths who manufacture uh, these items and they, they prepare the guns and they prepare these projectiles and the uh, poachers get the gunpowder prepared and they use it for poaching. I'm just uh, taking you into the networks. Okay. Uh, this had a bit of an animation. I could not show you, but um, these poachers have, uh, you know, their expertise, their way of poaching. You can see that this, um, uh, this guy who is, uh, who's a arrested poacher is showing where exactly how, uh, you know, the, he, he shot the elephant and that's a dead elephant, which was discovered after a week after it was shot. So, um, you know, various poachers, various uh, hunters got their their um, their specific areas to shoot the elephant. Some of them call it as a headshot. It's uh, above the eye, they shoot elephant. And some of them prefer the, the shoulder shot, which is uh, uh, a shot at the shoulder, which will puncture the, the, the lungs. And uh, in many cases, the, the heart and the, the, the projectile will lodge on the other side on the a leg uh, on the bone which will damage the bone also so various poachers got uh, various methods of shooting elephants and uh, they use various uh, techniques to remove ivory uh, some of them told us that you know they shoot the elephant and then they will leave the carcass for a couple of days uh, so that it will decay a bit and they can pull out the ivory easily and uh, no, nowhere it is a it is a pleasant thing uh, you know, you have to kill the elephant, then you have to, you know, cut the ivory, uh, which is uh, actually a, a teeth with uh, blood vessels running through it. You have to cut open the elephant's uh, body and uh, pull the ivory out. Um, so they collect ivory and uh, they, after this uh, poaching trips, they hide the guns inside the forest. Uh, 
we don't want people to know about the guns because uh, many of them told us that it is very difficult to carry a gun into the forest and very difficult to bring the gun outside the forest so usually the the main shooter who is also the gun owner will hide the guns inside the forest sometimes it is inside the trees you can see that there is a gun kept inside a tree in the in the middle of the forest you will never be able to find this guns these are actually you know uh, decades old um, hiding locations for these guns the shooter will ensure that the other gang members are sitting at one place and he will walk away and hide these guns inside a uh, very safe places within the forest and uh, only the shooter will know the location of the gun the other picture you can see that the the, the gun is kept in a in a in a polythene bag in 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 not a polythene bag it is covered in polythene and uh, kept in a hidden location so they keep the guns inside the forest after collecting the ivory uh, they they hide the gun so that they can come back to the place and uh, collect the gun and do the shooting again and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, showing you a landscape of uh, Kerala where various gangs were operating. So many of these uh, people, um, you, you, I don't know whether you can read it. Uh, many of these people had their demarcated areas. So if you can see on the lower, uh, sorry, upper left corner, that was the biggest gang which operated in the landscape. Uh, it is uh, Mr. Vasu and his team. So they, they controlled a large area and... Uh, between the poachers, they had a between these gangs, they had an understanding that you know we will we will handle this area. You will not be you know interfering in in our area. So then there were other three gangs which were smaller gangs in the same landscape. They they operated in smaller areas. If you can see that there are small dots in the in the map where you can see the uh, the areas where they poach the elephants. So when uh, you know when you look at this kind of um, uh, poachers and when you try to understand them. Um, you 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 see there is a lot of dynamics between these gangs. Um, mostly, mo in most cases, the 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 main shooter is the gang leader, and uh, he will control the gang. He will ensure that the gang is uh, under his control. He will decide the date of poaching. He will decide the uh, the seasonality. He will decide uh, who all will come for poaching, and uh, he will control everything. And uh, in most of the gangs, there will be a second leader. Who, who always uh, aspire to become the, the lead poacher. So every gang will have a, a, an offshoot later. Somebody will start on their own. So there is a dynamics between these guys. And um, another interesting thing uh, which we understood is that, you know, this landscape, Kerala, Malayatur, Walchal, all these areas, uh, Chalakudi, all these areas were historically elephant poaching areas from, uh, from you know, uh, the history which I know is about from 1960s to 1970s. There were elephant poaching. There, there were, we, we call, you know, some of them are, some of them were infamously legendary elephant poachers. They all operated in this area. And um, um, when we, when we interacted with these guys and we asked the, how you formed your gangs, you know, um, very interestingly, they told us that, you know, uh, many times they met in the, in the courtrooms because there were cases against them in, in local courts and for elephant poaching and they go for their, uh, hearings and they, they they hear another fellow is also in the court who is involved in elephant poaching cases so some of the gang story was very interesting that you know uh, one fellow told that sir i went to uh, went where uh, i had a case where i was a carrier of ivory and i i met a few other people who were involved in elephant poaching so then we we stuck a conversation and we had a couple of uh, uh, tea outside and then we started meeting and we started talking and um, then they de decided that they worked together so you know courtrooms and the premise court premises became uh, meeting places for elephant poachers so they developed their gangs they they built their equations between each other that they ensured that they don't overlap each other's territory and uh, if you look at it uh, uh, you know uh, we all thought that uh, you know uh, summer will be the time when they shoot elephants but uh, uh, they told us that it is monsoon they prefer because monsoon there is a lot of rain happening in the forest i mean in the in the region and because of the rain, the sound of the gunshots is muffled. So nobody will listen. I mean, nobody will listen. And also the, the forest is the, the streams are uh, uh, full and uh, patrolling will be very less. So there will be less presence of forest guards in the in the forest. So it is easy for them to hide and uh, uh, conduct their activities. And you can see in the pictures that you know it is difficult. It was this was a picture taken during a investigation into the in, in into the field 
where we had to cross uh, multiple streams to reach the location where uh, the shooting happened and um, also their wisdom they said that uh, you know um, during monsoon uh, if you shoot an elephant uh, the carcass will be uh, decaying much faster and also the the undergrowth you know the vines and other shrubs will grow faster and it will cover the dead body very fast so that you know nobody will see it by the time the rains are over um, after a couple of months when the forest staff come for patrolling they will they will have nothing to see so there is a lot of practical wisdom in these people uh, when they when they looked at poaching from their their side i mean i say that these people always had a, a very good understanding of forest and uh, understanding of the the animal behavior and uh, how they have to hide their activities from authorities um they always camped inside the forest um, you know uh, safe locations where uh, elephants don't attack them at night uh, usually these are um, you know um, on top of rocks um, rock formation where they can lit fire and cook food and stay there we we actually visited some of the camp sites and, and understood what they do and um, poaching happens in uh, in a wide variety of habitats whether it is grassland whether it is a covered forest or it is reed uh they always selected areas which are away from uh, uh truck paths uh, away from patrolling routes they wait for the elephants to reach their preferred location so, so that they can shoot the elephant so they decide where the elephant should be shot and uh, they shot elephants in areas where usually forest guards don't go uh where the dead body of elephant can be hidden and uh, even if it is hit, even if, if even if they they leave the carcass for a couple of days to decay nobody should detect it so that is why so you know uh, we could not find a pattern um, you know we could not say that which which area they will shoot elephants it was grassland it was uh, you know thick forest it was reeds wherever they they found it is a suitable area to shoot the elephant and hide the carcass and you know carry on their activities without getting detected they they selected those areas to shoot elephants and uh, i'm not uh, getting into the details of everything but um, after all this um, shooting uh, one second okay i got very little time so after all this shooting after all this collection of ivory this was the statues which was which were made and you can see that this all indian gods and goddesses and um, ironically you can see the 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 very elephant god in the in the middle these are unfinished the statues uh, which are made of ivory uh you can see the elephant god himself uh, made of ivory and um, it was shocking when we looked at uh, the the quantum of the trade the 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 amount of um, ivory articles which were recovered from the suspected traders and uh, carvers you can see uh, a wide uh, variety of ivory carvings which were available with the carvers and uh, these were some of the ivory carving tools and before moving forward i would like to tell you also um, when we um, studied a bit about the ivory carving in kerala it was actually uh, um, a form of art which was uh, patronized by the travancore kings uh, from the 1900s or uh, sorry from the mid of 1800s to 1900s uh, where uh, people from tamil nadu and uh, some part of karnataka good artists were brought to kerala and the kings uh, actually requested them to carve uh, idols and carve uh, things on ivory because ivory was very much available in kerala and uh, during the british rule uh, in in the early 1900s uh, there were uh, there were established ivory carving centers the industrial ivory carving centers which operated till 1960s and 1970s in kerala so we are looking at a rich uh, history and culture and skill of ivory carving in kerala some of this uh, tools which were recovered from the artisans were used for generations um, these are specialized equipment for ivory carving so the the challenge is that you are looking at availability of ivory you are looking at availability of poachers who can supply ivory to the artisans and there are buyers who are ready to buy this ivory carvings at a very high rate and uh, yeah a few interesting facts also which i would like to bring your attention to because uh, most of you must have seen this beautiful images of tuskers in kerala which are used in 
temple processions and religious festivals or even in 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 cultural festivals in kerala majestic tuskers which are kept in captivity most of these tuskers are from other states which are uh, from bihar or assam or arunachal pradesh but these are our uh, you know celebrated elephants which are which even have fan clubs and fan pages in facebook and instagram uh, and which are followed by elephant lovers uh, but there is an unholy connection with this elephant population there are more than 500 such tuskers kept in captivity um every year uh, this tuskers uh, the the tusk is pruned so the front portion of the tusk about a half a feet to 1 feet is cut and we understood that uh, this cut tusk is actually uh, was the staple uh, supply of ivory into the illegal ivory trade you can look at the the photograph on the left side anybody who understand ivory and elephants you can see that this is actually ivory obtained from captive elephants so uh, there's a particular shape and there is a uh, there is smoothness of the ivory unlike the the wild elephant ivory you can see that this is actually ivory which is cut from the captive elephants um so that was uh, an interesting discovery that you know ivory from captive elephants actually sustain the trade across the country you know if you have about 500 elephants and you have uh, two tusks an average of uh, 300 400 kilograms of ivory was getting into the into the illegal trade market and this was a sustainable source of ivory because they don't need to kill the elephants they have to prune the tusk and they have to take the front portion of it and uh, they supplied it to the trade market <clears throat> also um, you know um uh, fake ivory uh, the imitation ivory actually the ivory traders had uh, this kind of statues in their houses and in their showrooms which look like ivory so this was actually a mechanism to lure uh, customers to the trade so this is actually epoxy this is plastic and uh, in their art galleries and in their five star hotel showrooms and shops they keep this kind of ivory articles and uh, people go there and they examine it and they 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 show some interest and uh, that is when the 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 sellers tell them that you know if you want to have real ivory then i can supply you real ivory this is this is actually fake and uh, if you are worth more than this fake ivory plastic ivory you can actually buy uh, you know real ivory so uh, there was uh, a lot of fake ivory in the market which was uh, which almost almost looked like ivory unless and until you are an expert and uh, this um, this imitation ivory actually created the market and sustained the sustained the market in in many places so that you know uh in uh, in hindi in india there is a there is a saying that you know elephant has got two type of teeth one is to chew and one is to scare people the tusk is to scare people and the molars are there to chew so this is actually that kind of a hidden game that these people usually use this uh, plastic ivory to attract customers and uh, yeah now uh, what's the way forward i mean i told you about the problems and uh, uh how this is uh, countered uh, now uh, you know now uh, in the elephant range areas especially in the southern india where we work a lot with the state forest department um, from 2015 uh, a lot of preventive um, intelligence gathering and response is on the ground to ensure that this kind of incidents don't happen <laughs> see unlikely um, unlike any other um, uh, crime or criminal activities um wildlife crime is irreversible if you kill a tiger or a leopard or an elephant there is no way you can put it back to wild so uh, a lot of this preventive intelligence and responses are very much in, uh, needed to ensure that our, our animals don't get killed because um you know recovering ivory articles from a trader is uh, not a proud moment for enforcement officers it is actually a moment of failure because uh, collectively we all fail to you know protect the elephant and um, yeah of course um, you know forest department is now identifying and re recruiting listening posts within the trade networks to ensure that you know um, there are there is a constant supply of intelligence about the movement of elephant uh, poachers and traders uh, within the region so that you know you can stop them and um, definitely these cases uh, you know um, by cap cat catching an elephant poacher or uh, you know um, arresting him and filing a case against him is not everything we have to follow up these cases in the court to ensure that these people get conviction because many people who are involved in elephant poaching cases got multiple cases pending against them in the courts uh, because our judicial system is uh, you know 
it's pretty slow when it comes to wildlife crimes because there is very little follow ups happens in many places so they they get involved in crime they get out and they have a case going on and they are branded as an elephant poacher or a ivory trader they get into the same thing again to continue their uh, businesses so that that we have to you know uh, ensure that they get convictions and um, the patrolling has increased in the forest especially in monsoon now there are monsoon camps in the forest like now as we speak the monsoon has already started in kerala and i was talking to a couple of senior officers in last 24 hours they said yes it is uh, the staff is actually going and camping inside the forest to ensure that you know people don't come back to you know, come back to poach and um, of course you know we have to build good community relations around the uh, around the elephant areas because elephants do come out for crop raids so if people are not on your side it is very difficult to you know control poaching because people will keep their eyes shut and mouth shut uh, when it when poaching happens so without local community support many poaching cannot happen so you have to build a lot of local community support and um, definitely we have to look at uh, you know uh, modern technology and tools uh, for you know wildlife crime investigation and information management i'm very happy and uh, uh, proud to tell you that uh, wildlife trust of india work with various state forest departments across the country not only with kerala karnataka and tamil nadu but many other states to you know counter illegal wildlife trade whether it is elephants whether it is tigers whether it is rhinos we work with the state forest department assist them in uh, in various aspects of fighting wildlife crime whether it is uh, assisting them in investigations assisting them on field level operations or helping them with uh, legal support in court which often is very much required or uh, you know or uh, training the frontline staff in fighting wildlife crime the organization has uh, trained i think more than 20000 people across the country to you know fight illegal wildlife trade and uh, even these days uh, uh, our team is working with uh, enforcement agencies to fight illegal wildlife trade online because cyberspace is also becoming a, a major platform for illegal wildlife trade so there are various ways uh, we support uh, we work with the uh, state forest department to counter illegal wildlife trade across the country and uh, that's it and uh, i i think i should also tell you that um, the entire incident which i was uh, touching upon was converted into a, a, a series by amazon prime so if any of you would like to understand more about elephant poaching and uh, understand how these things happen uh, you may watch the series poacher in amazon i think uh, richi who is the creator of the series also joined today with us uh, so please watch a poacher to have an understanding about the elephant poaching and ivory trade uh, in western ghats and uh, with uh, this image i would uh, like to stop uh, whether you want a majestic tusker in the wild or you want the tusker to be converted uh, into lord ganesha i am absolutely sure lord ganesha may not be very happy with you if you make a, a ganesha statue with a, uh, with stolen ivory blood ivory uh, a plastic epoxy ganesha statue will be more than enough for the lord to hear your prayers and uh, i think uh, whomever is here will carry that message to yourself and to people around to ensure that we don't end up buying any ivory thank you very much and i think i will open for questions after stopping the presentation thank you jose this was uh, absolutely um, you know absolutely heart wrenching webinar uh, you know uh, seeing all those slides and information that you gave us that you know the kind of methodology that's been used it's not it's not an easy job for ngos and forest department to to you know to curb these problems unless we have the entire janta the entire country with us aligned to protect elephants and you know um elephants as uh, as vivek calls them you know he calls them near persons 97% of human brain like uh, some of the apes you know and they're just us they're right there and they're helping us as guardians of the jungle and we don't see that we we just see them as animals right and i think there's there isn't much difference uh, you know in terms of respect in terms of uh, uh, divinity in terms of everything that we need to give utmost respect i want you to tell people 
what is wildlife trust of india doing uh, to help elephants and how wildlife trust of india really wants everyone's support um mohit uh, you know uh, first of all we want you to you know be cautious and careful about illegal wildlife products because i am i was going through the chat somebody is telling that my mother is telling me that her young time the chuda was um, uh, made of ivory so that is that is a cultural connection that you know when you know that some product is made of uh, uh, any wildlife please don't buy it uh, whether it is a peacock feather or mongoose hair brush or hatha jodi or ivory product it is not uh, it is not going to bring you any good luck or any status uh, so please don't buy it the other thing is that the organization is doing a lot of conservation projects and um, please you are welcome to connect with us and uh, support us in whatever way you can it can be volunteering it can be supporting it can be you know taking a project in your area there are many ways to support please drop an email and uh, you know we'll be more than happy to you know connect with you to take the conservation work across also i think uh, if you can give a, a two minute brief on elephant corridors why they are important and what is it that wti wants from every one of us yeah um uh, mohit elephant corridors are identified uh, pathways uh, across the country we have identified 101 corridors across the country where uh, elephants traditionally moved from one um, habitat to other habitat or one protected area to other protected area these were their seasonal migration uh, for example if it rains too much in one area it is too slippery for elephants then they move to an area where there is less rain or if in an area where there is uh, too much of drought then they move to an area where they get water so this is generation old uh, um, you know migration routes which were um, encroached or which were occupied by people um or 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 disconnected due to various reasons so we identified this corridors across the country and uh, trying to protect so that the movement between uh, habitats of elephants is uh, is facilitated which also will reduce the human wildlife conflict because when elephants are able to move from one to another area uh, they don't scatter around they don't move around to uh, for crop damage or uh, trying to find um, alternate routes because there were uh, examples where you know somebody built a wall across uh, an elephant corridor uh, the elephant uh, came back to the herd came back to the um, uh, place and they, they 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 found that there is a wall so what happened is that they walked across and they found wherever the wall ended they walked through that area so that was a new area for elephants and they damaged properties and uh, crops there so we have to be very 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 um, conscious about this uh, um elephants uh, route and ensure that this routes are unhindered and uh, they move from one area to another area which is very much essential for the elephant population and also which is very much essential to reduce the human elephant conflict wonderful uh one more question to you before i start taking other questions is that uh, um mohit i could not hear you um, in a regular basis you require money uh, can you hear me now yes i'm audible yes so i'm, I'm saying on a regular basis uh, you know conservation organization like wildlife trust of india would need large sums of money to secure these corridors or to conduct a project in the corridor or to align people the local people and the villagers or the industries or the you know to to be able to give safe passage to the elephants you know how what would be your appeal to people to to uh, uh, to amass that money so that you know that money comes in handy for at least one corridor or 10 corridors or 20 corridors you know what is it that you would uh, say um from pohit uh... you know securing elephant corridors uh, as is as big as elephants um, you know land cost us a lot of money and uh, some elephant corridors are uh, you know hundreds of acres some elephant corridors are few acres but uh, also we have to be very 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 sensitive about the people who stay in this corridor we have to relocate them for example in uh, our corridor relocation in wynad 
we 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 really look at the families uh, with their households and their house into new areas so settling this people in new areas with new houses new land like if they had one acre of land we we ensured that they have one acre of land a uh, fertile land where they can cultivate and if they had a house we give them a better house because you cannot ask people to move out and uh, you know live in a different condition we always have to ensure that they live in a better condition so these things require a lot lots of money so people can support our elephant conservation program elephant corridor programs by donating to wti or you know sponsoring corridors we have got uh, uh, you know csr supports and uh, individual supporting our work so anybody who can you know who would like to support can come and uh, get in touch with us and there is a, there is always support is always welcomed um, whether it is small or big because uh, you know um it is uh, sometimes it is uh, the 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 small small donations actually make it bigger to uh, bigger and helping us to buy large corridors so it is it is always fun yeah wonderful and some corporates can also invest in um you know in land uh, to protect a, a particular corridor or a few corridors so so friends when you hear and you're listening to this information if you can send your email to with your interest to wildlife trust of india that'll be fantastic uh, arinita if you hear can you type in the chat box the... i have uh, already already shared the email id um okay. i've given our info id to people so anybody would like to get in touch with us can write to us and uh, one of us will definitely get back to you okay so i'll take a few questions um uh, jose uh, yeah. the there's a question um, from from Mr. Noel. I've seen legal trimming of tusks. What do they do with it? Because um, it, it it is actually a practice by elephant donors uh, that they have to trim the tusk every year. As per the law, the trimmed tusk should be handed over to the forest department uh, after an inspection. So in many cases, they will trim the tusk and. Uh, they will give only a small portion to the forest department and the rest of it they will hide so you know uh, it, it it is uh, it is a malpractice like if you if you cut about um, uh, 7 inches of tusk what you will submit to the forest department is about one and a half inch tusk and um, uh, the elephant will never answer no how many inches of tusk was stolen from him so uh, they will they will cut the tusk and they will submit to the forest department a few inches of tusk and the large portion of the tusk will be uh, taken to the illegal market. This is a this is an unholy nexus between the Mahouts and some elephant owners with the uh, ivory traders. So many ivory traders had their direct connections with the Mahouts to ensure that uh, the tusk is uh, you know pruned tusk is available to them. Even if it is a captive elephant, uh, uh, possession of ivory is illegal. Right. Okay. Um, Nishant is asking. It is said that globally. Illegal wildlife trade promotes other illegal activities such as drugs and trafficking. Too many people I felt think illegal wildlife stops with the wildlife only. That creates apathy towards illegal wildlife activities. Please share some light into this type of connection regarding illegal wildlife trade that affect human life uh, and have impact on attitude of people. Can you share some insights? Yeah, um, see, um, it is globally known that illegal wildlife trade is part of larger um, organized um, uh, criminal syndicates. For example, uh, best example is from India itself. Uh, the insurgents in Northeast used uh, rhino horn as an investment because they conducted rhino horn and ivory and uh, sold to the Myanmarese uh, uh, traders earlier to collect money for arms and ammunition. And even today, that is quite possible because uh, rhino horns fetch a, a lot of money in the international market so uh, these products will go to the international market and uh, you know supply um, arms and ammunition unodc already studied and they already came up with um, findings that uh, ivory trade in uh, in africa fueled some of the insurgent groups and terrorist groups uh, which uh, which which undertook uh, serious um, um, terrorism activities in africa uh, on the other hand, um, you know, for example, if you are trading, um, I mean, I witnessed myself uh, tiger skin trade or tiger bone trade when they were selling it to Nepalese um, uh, or um, Tibetan buyers. There was always a possibility of getting counterfeit um, counterfeit currency 
or drugs which were bartered because you know it is easy to carry these things across the border and uh, it always uh, gave them a profit because if you sell tiger skin worth of uh, worth 5 lakhs you will get uh, drugs or weapons worth 5 lakhs and you bring it to the domestic market and sell it into the domestic market so that that gives you a profit so th that's always there the connection between um, arms and illegal ivory i mean illegal wildlife trade many people who are involved in the trafficking of wildlife goods are also involved in trafficking of uh, uh, narcotic substances especially in the indo nepal border area where they were uh, trafficking shatush uh, they were involved in uh, trafficking of drugs so it is very much known that these people are involved in uh, in illegal activities also the other interesting thing is that um, see for example if i make a lot of money selling ivory where will i invest because this money is not came through through bank transactions this money is actually you know paid in cash so where will you invest in you will invest in an illegal business you will evade tax so it's a chain of rea it's, a, it's, a, it's a chain reaction that you get illegal money you want to invest it in something illegal or you will find something illegal to you know multiply the money nobody will get the money and they will sit idle with the money so they have to hide the money they have to invest the money they have to you know you know make more money so tax evasion corruption involvement in in other illegal activities hawala all these things are connected with a um, illegal wildlife trade it is it is very organized it is very 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 much of a syndicate in nature in many places so there is um, a lot of involvement okay um, yes, Deepika, uh, Seda, and Avin, you can write to Wildlife Trust of India if you're passionate about wildlife conservation. They they do have uh, uh, you know different kinds of programs for people who want to volunteer or intern or work with Wildlife Trust of India. They're always looking out for people, so please write to them on the email that's been given by Jos. Uh, Jose, there's another uh, question that's been written by two or three people. How to differentiate between real and fake ivory? <laughs> that, that, that needs another session altogether. Uh, there are, uh, what can I say? I mean, a trained uh, a person uh, who is in, into the trade can differentiate between real ivory and fake ivory pretty fast. Um, there's something known as sugar lines on ivory which is actually when you take ivory under a, under a magnifying glass, um, real uh, finished ivory products will have a crisscrossed lines. If you look at it, it will it will form a web-like pattern like you look at my, my fingers. So it will look like this. It is a 120 degree angle patterns on the ivory. You use a magnifying glass to look at the ivory. Then you will see this fine lines crisscrossing ivory. So that is the best uh, way to uh, find whether it is uh, real or genuine ivory. Then there are a few other methods which are slightly complicated. But whenever you see any suspected ivory material, take it under a microscope. I'm uh, sorry, a magnifying glass and look at it. Or if you don't have a magnifying glass, the best thing is that use your mobile phone, zoom in and take a picture and uh, you can mail it to us. I can tell you whether it is ivory or not, if it is a reasonably good picture. Wonderful. Shraddha Gogoi says, um, uh, how to empower local communities so that they don't resort to illegal wildlife practices? And what are the alternative jobs so that basic needs or rights are met? That's actually, you know, a very difficult question to answer. Um, Local community, if they are not directly involved in illegal wildlife trade, it is pretty easy. You ensure that their livelihoods are protected, their interests are safeguarded so that they don't support um, illegal wildlife trade. Uh, that uh, the state forest departments, uh, the central government and uh, conservation organizations, everyone should work towards that. You know, without people, without the help of local community, without the involvement of local community, I don't think that we can conserve uh, forest and wildlife because... Our forests are open treasure for everyone. So the, the I, I believe that the local community, the fringe area community is the actual guardians of wild because many of them uh, work as, uh, you know, uh, daily wages or even forest guards in the forest. But uh, at the same time, they also ensure that uh, there is uh, protection provided uh, from outside elements. 
but um, if you fail to uh, protect their interest especially uh, don't manage human wildlife conflict very well uh, then there will be a problem so first thing is to ensure that you know every park manager every protected area manager should work with the community in the fringe area to understand their needs and their requirements and find a balance you may not be able to fulfill all their needs if somebody is telling you that sir i need a i need a couple of teak trees to build my house you may not be able to help them so you have to find a balance you have to you have to tell them that you know that is not possible uh, but at the same time you should ensure that the benefits of conservation is given to them some of the best examples are uh, you know uh, kana randambur periyar where tourism is playing a major role where tourists are coming they are staying in homestays they are buying things you know local products are promoted they are getting more money so then they understand that you know it is good to have those animals alive uh, than it get killed and that that messaging has to be there with the local community so then they will support conservation some of these parks uh, you know there is absolute local support for conservation efforts because they benefit from conservation so we have to um, get the uh, get the support and confidence of the local community to ensure conservation so that's the way out here so my trainings lately in manas and uh, in manas and raimona uh, will start to take effect and then you know we would be able to go ahead and create more business models for them you know um, you know the recent trainings that i did in these two areas um, so i think ecotourism is a, is a very very big step forward because it sort of guarantees certain kind of livelihood for the local communities and they start to expand their their outlook into other ways of making money and supporting uh, you know conservation so i think ecotourism is one of the key success stories wherever you want conservation with the community mohit i think i completely agree with you because uh, a, 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 a live bird is uh, uh, more sustainable than a dead bird very simple because yeah. if it was, if a visitor is coming to see a rare bird uh, if uh, if every year you are getting 10 to 15 visitors even to see a rare bird in a in a remote village i know certain places in arunachal pradesh there are certain birds which are found only in in, in few villages people spend a lot of money to go there and uh, see this bird so they spend a lot of money on their stay guides so they will understand that it is it is more profitable than you know shooting it and uh, eating it which will last probably 5 10 minutes so you know we have to train people to understand the value of uh, their own backyard wildlife and um, yes ecotourism play a major role in in promoting wildlife conservation yeah wonderful what is uh, the use of tusk to an elephant apart from its defense well that is the best thing <laughs> you know a tusk is not for decoration the tusk is for defense a tusk is to you know show supremacy uh uh in in the asian elephant population only few of them are tuskers few males are tuskers so they have a better chance of mating so uh they have a better chance of defending so it it, it is an essential part of an elephant uh, uh, a male elephant to uh, to establish his supremacy around uh, as a tusker it is not for decoration definitely okay. and is any medicine let me add let me add yeah a tusk is also used to you know um, you know uproot trees and uh, you know for foraging food so it's 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 good for a yeah. tusker to have a tusk yeah i've seen a tusker taking out the bark yeah. of a tree so smoothly and uh, and eating it it was uh, you know as if it's sort of a digestive it's using it as a digestive wonderful is any medicinal use of ivory ivory a uh, very few um in ayurveda i came across with uh, some use of ivory powdered ivory or uh, burned ivory ivory ash was used for some medicines but uh, not much uh, used in india as a part of medicines not much okay. what's your opinion um, about the elephants in our temples is it necessary well it is a very 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 difficult question which you are asking to uh, a person from kerala um well it is uh, part of culture part of tradition and um, if you look at from an elephant side i don't think that elephant is very happy in the temple uh, in the middle of firecrackers and heat and uh, sound the elephant is not very happy it is uh, 
our belief that the elephant is uh, enjoying the temple procession i i don't agree with the people those who tell that oh you know you look at the elephant it is enjoying no it's not enjoying it's a wild animal in my opinion it's a wild animal it belongs to wild and uh, an elephant is very happy in the wild enjoying the rain mud and the walking around in the wild not your attention in the middle of the city i i really don't think that i agree with the, an elephant is happy in the temple um i i i i think lord ganesha is happy in the wild not in in chains in shackles i think um, elephant craves connection so when it craves connection and if it's out in the wilderness then the connection will be with its other kind of animals in the forest or its own beings and then once it's with humans then it's with humans you know it creates connection and yeah. you can see there's a lot of love that happens between people and elephants you know with with the ones which are captive or have grown with people so uh, so like like how vivek says it's near near person you know uh, it, it has a beauty about it with people yeah mohit you know it, it it's it's a very 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 selfish thing to bring those elephants to any religious place and keep it uh, you know elephants are happy in the wild i mean you are chaining them you are you are you are you are crubbing all their freedom of movement and uh, making them as slaves i mean there's a huge difference between a wild elephant and a captive elephant in the behavior a captive elephants are stressed animals in chains <coughs> My, my question is that if it is a happy animal, why it create uh, ruckus every year? Every year, the temple elephants kill people. Every year, the temple elephant, uh, you know, turn vehicles upside down. They throw bikes around, and they they run mad across the temple grounds. Why are they happy animals? They are not. So it is it is certain cultural beliefs that are certain religious beliefs which are uh, which we may have to look at and say that we don't need this captive elephants. uh in in temples so, so you know that's my belief i mean even if you look at uh, religiously do you think uh, lord ganesha would be happy to be chained <laughs> very simple simple yeah that was wonderful i think jose uh, there are many other questions but we don't have time to take all of them and um, uh, you know i posted the link here uh, for people to visit wti website and you posted the email id uh, get somebody from office to uh, to reply to them and i'll also share this in the chat with your team so yeah. that you can reply to them in detail and i'm sure there is enough repository of information which is already there on your website you all you need to do is direct them and uh, include them into your system to help conservation further yeah absolutely mohit that yeah. i would like to tell everyone that if you have a question please ask us and uh, i'm personally very happy to uh, you know answer the questions if you have any of these questions i mean please write us to the info mail id and um, you know I'll, i'll i'll ensure that i answer you that's a promise wonderful wonderful so friends uh, this was an eye opening webinar it was uh, heart wrenching at the same time and it also is inspiring to see that there are committed people like joe's and the team and people at wildlife trust of india who are working non stop relentlessly to save these animals and we are on a mission completely aligned with wildlife trust of india so what we are doing here in delhi in a small base is that we do earth walks where we sort of sensitize people we show them different kinds of animals birds smallies which we call creepy crawlies which we you know now this sunday we've got one expert either rewilding expert vijay dasmana who is going to take you out into a ravalis to make you see uh, how rewilding is done and what is the meaning of rewilding just by planting trees is sometimes not enough uh, you need to understand the science behind it so if you're interested you could write to us and we'll take you there this sunday in the meantime uh, you know start sensing the need of saving the elephants whether it's african elephant or it's asian elephant these two are on our on our planet and we need
need to be responsible for them. We can't have our elephants go away while we're living. It's not fair. So thank you so much, Joes, and thank you so much, my team, for putting this webinar together. I love you all. It was fantastic. And thank you, all the participants, for being here and supporting us. Thank you, Mohit. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank it's you, everyone. We'll take it. Thank forward. you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.